Uh, good afternoon to our audience in Hong Kong and the Asia Pacific time zone. Uh, good evening to those in the Americas and a very early good morning for those in Europe. So thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm Becky Liu, Director of the Institute of Transport Studies, uh, together with Professor W.Y. Sito, Deputy Director of the Institute, we are hosting the Distinguished Transport Lecture today. So to begin with, let me invite Professor Sito to give an overview of our Institute and the Distinguished Transport Lecture Series. Professor Sito, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Becky Lu. Uh, the Distinguished Transport Lecture Series is one of the major events of our Institute of Transport Studies. This institute was formed in year 2003. It is a university center. The missions and objectives are to provide a platform for all academic staff and students in different departments to work together to do transport research, to join the APA research grants, and to collaborate with national and international researchers so as to do multidisciplinary research. We organize seminars, conferences, workshops from time to time to publicize the image of Hong Kong U as an institution committed to science studies. Our institute consists of staff and students from seven out of 10 faculties at Hong Kong U, including the Faculty of Social Sciences, the Lee Ka Shing Faculty of Medicine, Faculty of Law, Faculty of Engineering, Faculty of Business and Economics, Faculty of Arts, and Faculty of Architecture. We have different types of memberships, including full fellows, as shown here, only fellows, affine fellows, and student fellows. They are contributing to research or activities of our institute. We are expanding our research network. Currently, UC David is one of our JGIC partners. We had a project entitled Together in a Sustainable Transport Dream at the Two Bay Areas, One Dream, Two Bay Areas. This project was funded by UC David Hong Kong U Collaborations in Research Scheme. UCL is also our JGIC partner. We organize different activities based on Hong Kong U UCL JGIC Partnership Fund. In 2018, we jointly organized a conference with CILTHK and the Transport Department of Hong Kong on smart mobility and logistics. We attracted over 330 participants from Hong Kong, the mainland China, and 14 countries of the rest of the world. We have also organized the Distinguished Transport Lecture Series since 2009. Up to now, we have invited more than 30 speakers. They came to Hong Kong to give their lectures from all over the world except those presenting this year due to COVID-19. To name a few, we invited Chen Yaba from US. Uh, he is currently the editor-in-chief of Transportation Research Party. Gilbert Laporte from Canada, the former editor-in-chief of Transportation Research Science. Michael Bell from Australia. David Benster from UK, the former editor-in-chief of Transport Reviews. Kyle Hausen from Switzerland, editor-in-chief of Transportation. This year, we have a Distinguished Transport Lecture Series 2021. We would like to thank all our sponsors for their generous support. Without them, we won't have this series this year. That's all for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. And to express our gratitude to the financial sponsors, may I now invite the financial sponsors to join us for the group photo. Uh, for the rest of the audience and the ITS fellows, we shall take the group photos at the end of the lecture. So Ga Ho, can you lead us through here? Great, thank you, Professor Lu. So may I now invite the representative of our first sponsor, Prafo Transport Service Limited, Ms. Penny Chong, please. Ms. Chung, please turn on your camera. Okay, we find you, okay. Thank you. So uh, next, we would like to invite uh, DHL Global Forwarding Hong Kong Limited, Mr. Mark Slade. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mark. And we would like to invite 
Hong Kong Left Hand Drive Motors Association Limited, Ms. Dobby Chen. Then we would like to invite the Kowloon Motor Bus Company 1933 Limited, Mr. Gary Lan. Hi, and thank you, Professor. And, yeah, thank uh, you, Gary. Thank you a lot. Then MTR Corporation, Mr. William Wong. Hello, everybody. Yeah. Hello, William. Thank you. Hello. So we will take a photo now. All right, get ready. So one, two, three, smile. Okay, we take one more. One, two, three. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. So now let me introduce the speaker. So it gives me great pressure to introduce uh, to the audience today, Professor Lawrence Frank, the speaker of our distinguished transport lecture today. So can is it can you hear me all well? Yes. Great. And for the rest of the audience, maybe you can mute yourself. Okay, so Larry has been named one of the walkability pioneers and he oh, began, uh, yeah, <laughs> we are still hearing some noises. Yeah, okay. He began using the term walkability in the early 1990s and his work directly led to walk score and has been cited over 40,000 times. So Larry was also among the very first to quantify connections between built environment, active transportation, and health. Now in this week, the Thomas and Routers top 1% researchers, or now we call carry rate, highly cited researchers have been announced. And Larry has been on this prestigious list for years. And he is also number one top ranked planning academic in North America, according to a recent Google Scholar ranking. His research specializes in the interaction between land use, travel behavior, air quality, and health, and in the energy use and climate change impacts of urban form policies. So these are all very important topic to humankind nowadays. No wonder even with our short publicity campaign of less than two weeks, we have already had over 200 registered participants for the event today. So without further ado, let us invite Professor Lawrence Frank. Larry, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Becky Lou, And uh, I'd like to thank Chris. I saw um, Dean Webster there and uh, glad to uh, be part of your event. Thank you so much for the opportunity, I'm honored. Um, there's a lot of people that are awake very late, very early, or maybe right in the middle of the day. So um, our, um, let me see if, um, let me get, see if I can get my uh, talk um, set to roll. There's the share screen, wait a minute, share screen. Hang on here. I should be looking at my presentation. Yes, we are seeing it. Okay. So um, my talk, I thought when you asked me to give a lecture, um, I've given so many talks on walkability and health um, was really the first, you know, not just early, but it was 1988 when I started quantifying relationships between physical design characteristics of cities, it was Seattle that I was doing my work in and uh, travel. And I guess we, uh, I chose to include a measure of active travel because I, I realized it was not studied. And I was actually kind of told by many people in the transportation field that that was a very silly thing to do that studying walking um, was a um, just kind of a um, stupid, <laughs> literally. I was told by some of the most senior planning professors and transportation people that were, of course, my, you know, my role models that what I was doing was crazy. And I was, you know, studying walking was absolutely ludicrous. Um, they laughed at me. 
Um, and I thought, you know, every trip begins on foot. I think that there's something wrong here. Um, and I stuck with it. Um, and I kept working on it through the early 90s. Nobody was talking about walking. Or active travel is very important. And then in the 1996, the Surgeon General's report came out. There's an obesogenic society being developed. We're developing obesogenic environments and people aren't able to get physical activity and we're sedentary. And it's a really big problem and it's global and it's happening really fast. And then we watched over the next 20 years what's happened since then to today where even the pandemic, um, the likelihood of surviving COVID is a function of whether or not you have a chronic disease, which is a function of whether or not um, in part uh, of your environment. Uh, and we know there's significant uh, uh, rational, empirical, causal pieces of evidence now published all over the place making this case. So it's been an interesting journey. And I guess the one thing I can say is when someone says, and there are students listening, if you have a passion for something and you feel it and you know it's important, you will be told if you're doing something that bucks the system. In the case, I was in such a car dependent environment that people couldn't even, or possibly some funding for transit, but not much. 90% more going to automobile uh, oriented infrastructure to the extent that it wasn't even possible for people to conceive that active transportation could even play a role, yet it's the mode of travel built into our body. That is absurd. So um, stick with your gut when you have an idea, because usually your best ideas are the ones that people will try to steer you away from. So that's all I have to say about that. Um, so anyways, the purpose of my talk today is so, okay, um, boy, there's been a lot of, uh, a, a tremendous amount of research on the linkages between the physical environment, both built and natural and travel and health and cost and monetization. I could swing this in 20 angles um, now and there's an enormous amount of evidence to the extent that the work that we've written 25 years ago, 30 years ago, uh, part of the citations on this in this area is the function that it's a burgeoning area of, of research. And it makes sense it would be. So I'm gonna try to address the fact that walkability um, and exposure to green space is not evenly, and this is not, this is the furthest thing from some, from new information. But when you're in a, if you're wealthy and you're in a walkable environment, you have a lot of amenities and a lot of benefits at your disposal. Stuff's easy to get to because it's close by. But if you're in a, if you're in a, if you're in a lesser uh, socioeconomic um, and lower income environment, um, the types of things that you're being exposed to, you don't have a lot of typically, not always, but there's reduced access to, to the benefits, the good stuff, the shops and the services, um, perhaps less of, um, perhaps, uh, um, it, well, definitely more air pollution exposure living al along arterials versus a couple blocks away. So you're exposed. So, so basically, I'm here to kind of talk about how to address the system at, that it's a responsibility, actually, not just a topic. Um, we can no longer be just talking about the links between the physical environment built and natural and perhaps social, um, or especially social, actually, um, and one's wellness um, without discussing their sociodemographic background or even being explicit enough to present and start to no longer tolerate or even encourage generalized findings that are not population specific or subgroup demographically focused. That we, by not doing that or failing to do that, we're actually part of the problem. Um, we're actually now prescribing as if a medicate, uh, like in any intervention or medication, something that doesn't actually work for those that are less affluent and less fortunate. And that's what I'll be talking a bit about. And then I'll kind of go into some examples of some of that research that we've, some research we've done that addresses it. And then I'm gonna show some examples of research that, that I've been part of a lot of that doesn't directly um, uh, distinguish findings across uh, sociodemographic groups. Although we always control for sociodemographics, it's different than actually um, a, uh, explicit study design that, that actually prescribes different 
impact uh, or prescriptions for different populations. Um, so I'm going to try to address systematic differences between affluent versus disadvantaged and their exposure to walkability's cofactors. We know for sure that walkability is systematically associated with certain things in different demographic contexts. The affluent, affluent get the good stuff, trees, shops, entertainment, transportation choices, and the disadvantaged get the bad stuff, the air pollution, the noise, the risk of injury, crime, heat island effect, um, lack of or lack of greenness. So we need to develop equity sensitive environmental metrics, um, healthy versus unhealthy forms of walkability. Although walkability is really the same stuff, it's really the mix, the density, the connectivity, um, the pedestrian amenities, all those things that make it walkable and the transit supportiveness, um, it's a little different um, for uh, than saying, um, you know, these other fact than ignoring the fact that these other factors are overridingly impact impactful. So um, I'm gonna start off with this diagram that I use a lot. Um, on the left, you have different environmental features, things that we can manipulate as planners and engineers and, and uh, people working on environments, uh, creating environments, uh, transportation infrastructure, land use or walkability. Most of our walkability metrics are actually land use measures on um, uh, the arrangement of activities in the urban environment. Uh, pedestrian environment features, or we call micro scale, the seating, the lighting, the trees, uh, the design, the infrastructure, the actual, uh, can you see into shops and services and, and that uh, permeability, and then green space. So these are all trans, uh, uh, decision making area arenas affect how much and where these investments go. That in turn affects travel and activity patterns that affects our behaviors such as diet, physical activity, social interaction, and what we're exposed to and over what period of time um, and the degree to which the concentrations are great or lesser. One of the problems with walkability, of course, is inherent is the compactness it requires. Without density, which is one of the components, there's really very little argument to be made. You can have a more walkable environment at a certain level of density, but complete dispersion of activities makes it very difficult inherently to walk. That's why we invented machines. <laughs> so we could get around because we can only walk so fast. Um, so that spatial arrangement is important. Well, that proximity creates increased exposure to air pollution. Uh, obviously the concentration of traffic creates injury risk and of course noise, which actually has been studied long before a lot of these other factors on our health, affecting blood cortisol level, affecting sleep disturbance. We have biological responses moving to the right to all these features. Um, our weight, um, inflammation, stress, which interact with each other. Those biological responses then actually affect, of course, chronic disease, physical and mental, as you see listed here. And there are many others, which actually for the purpose of a recent paper that we wrote um, in Sustainable Cities and Society just came out a couple months ago, affects the severity of illness or mortality risk for uh, chronic disease. So um, so it's, it's a, it, I, this diagram has sort of become uh, a way for me to communicate what is for me the way uh, at least the research um, endeavors that I'm involved in and my colleagues, it captures trying to organize it. I'm actually thinking to re, I'm going to reorganize it now. Uh, and I've got, a, there'll be a new iteration coming out soon that actually um, working with some new uh, partners helps me, helped me rethink a little bit about um, how this, how that works. So that's the endless learning process. So we have three geographic scales that we really kind of work at um, the regional um, transit investments, um, obviously mobility, getting around and accessibility regionally. Uh, um, that of course, then there's the walkability, uh, complete neighborhoods, the land use mix, all the walkability stuff that we usually, that I usually talk about or have. And then uh, the pedestrian environment, the micro scale. So there's the need for all three to line up in order to have an environment where it's really um, you need the good transit, you need the destinations and the compactness, and you also need a really nice pedestrian environment that's safe so that elderly and seniors can get around safely. Um, all of us can, for that matter, uh, youth and, and, and everyone. So 
so here you have kind of a, a continuum. I'm just going to make a quick run through of just some examples of ways that I've tried to use to communicate um, how to um, organize some of this. This is a kind of a, a, a transect uh, borrowing from Diwani um, uh, from Congress for the New Urbanism, but from the car dependent to the most walkable. To communicate this to the general public, which is something I have to do a lot, um, I try to use simple graphics. Um, so you can see on the left, uh, moving to the right, a quintiled uh, um, a characterization, a staircase of walkability. Examples uh, from aerial imagery and then street view to sort of show. And then this is in Vancouver. Um, I was a professor at University of British Columbia for 18 years until last year. Uh, it's been over a year now. I've been at University of California at San Diego. Um, so this work is based in Vancouver, but it would apply anywhere um, in the world. Um, and uh, so here's these five quintiles, as you can see, grayed out. And then using car dependent as the referent group, we joined and modeled using very large sample size surveillance data sets uh, where we have chronic disease information and address information and behavioral information. And we, can, we did mediation models to look at the direct and the indirect effects, the path analysis to establish uh, inference through cross-sectional data of hypotheses that we would test longitudinally, which is now uh, where we're mostly focused. Um, so this shows a 27% reduction in the likelihood of someone developing diabetes in a moderately walkable versus the most car dependent in it. 39%, that's a hell of a lot of a reduction, statistically speaking, a significant result um, uh, of likelihood of developing diabetes. But then the question becomes whom? Um, and so I don't have it here to present, but when we ran our models, we actually had enough data that we did um, parse it out. Uh, we did uh, stratified analysis and into buckets and we found different results. And the biggest point is that the most disadvantaged are where the chronic diseases are most concentrated. And spatially speaking, um, we actually know, um, of course, where, the, where, where our populations are most disadvantaged. So it's not such a stretch um, to be able to have the knowledge. And we actually don't need all of this research to even know this, is that that's where we need to invest. But the problem is when we make investments in communities that are disadvantaged, they gentrify and the poor get pushed out and uh, the prices, the prices go up. So we're still a ways from solving those problems, but we at least know where the problems are. And that's a bit of a help. Um, there's something a bit peculiar with this slide, but anyways, I can tell you the results is that with park access, numbers of parks nearby is actually correlated with walkability because smaller parks in a granular sense are more concentrated. You have more different uh, green space options in a more walkable place. If it's probably not, uh, if it's reasonably affluent, at least that's what we have found in many regions. Um, tree canopy is a better measure, or is a different measure, not a better measure actually, um, but uh, also has similar results where higher tree canopy associated with reduced likelihood, 18% uh, reduction in the likelihood of obesity for every 10% reduction in tree canopy, a result that we published in 2016, just to mention as an aside. Um, so a 37% reduction we found at the margins uh, in the air, in places with the most parks versus no parks. So shifting a bit now, um, so the questions we have are sort of developing responsible indices, composite versus individual measures. When we um, clump things together, so these other cofactors I'm about to talk about, they're all spatially correlated. Um, so as with walkability, we have all who do research in this area and learned early on uh, that where it's dense, you have more shops and services. Well, of course you do because there's more people to shop there. That's why people put their stores there. Um, not, a, not a great mystery, but it's also got a more dense connected grid. Um, there's usually better sidewalk and pedestrian infrastructure. All these things are spatially correlated. So we use principal components or factor analysis, or we sum up the Z, Z scores um, and we create composite indices, and then we can backside uh, unpack them and for their relative contribution if we're going to move into the space where we develop predictive models to apply to future decision making through things like health impact assessment and other tools which we build uh, and apply a lot. 
but um, you have to deal with the spatial multicollinearity. So that's a big question, but you could lose in, this, in the mix by clumping them together uh, a lot of the story of things and individually have the relative impact that might be unique. So uh, there's uh, questions around index and scoring and summarizing measures um, and how that differs for people of color and low income populations. Uh, and then uh, comparisons of opposites. Um, so that's a, a little bit on that. Um, so now I'm gonna show an example. So in, in 2009, uh, I was part of a paper. Um, uh, my uh, colleagues at University of British Columbia were interested, and I was as well in correlating. We have a very detailed walkability index. Uh, by, by about 2000, we had built quite a few walkability indices and had built, a, you know, over the last 25 years um, uh, with funding mostly from the National Institutes for Health doing health-based research really developed a lot of tools to measure walkability. Um, it came from the 80s, um, but uh, got carried forward. Um, and so here's an example in Vancouver um, where we kind of tested, we, where we, did, we tested the relationship between walkability and air pollution exposure. And I'll focus your attention on B. So if you look at B, so there's two different kind of groups of air pollutants, the micro level, a uh, hotspot, those that uh, uh, particulates, and NO is a marker on uh, uh, nitrous oxide for particulates that vary from one side of the street to the other. Um, two blocks away, they're gone. They're, they precipitate out of the air at roadway edge. Uh, small particulates, PM 2.5 and smaller, um, are really problematic, as you all most, I'm sure, know uh, from a health perspective. Um, they're really, um, there's been confirmatory evidence showing uh, heart attack increases uh, causal with exposure to particulates. Um, the um, C, image C, is ozone. Ozone um, is also, uh, uh, ozone kills is the name of a paper that uh, was published in top ranking journal by Michelle Bell, who I believe is a Yale professor or was at the time, uh, showing clearly problematic issues with ozone. But ozone is a more blanket kind of clumpy thing, secondary pollutant. I'm gonna focus on B right now because the spatial variation is so critical. Um, and then if you focus on D below, we've actually layered in the combination of where it is walkable, where we call uh, sweet spots and sour spots, where you actually have, if you, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the green um, areas here are where you have those few places. Now this is the Pacific Ocean to the West. And basically if from an income perspective in the city of Vancouver, West to East is like an income gradient. So basically, and it's, it's not a mystery, but this is um, upwind and um, uh, cleaner air off the Pacific. So you get the benefits of high walkability where you've got low, low both, both pollutants. So you got uh, lack, uh, less uh, oxides of uh, NO uh, or particulates and lower ozone, uh, O3. So, and as you look over here to the east, you find, and, in, and to the south a little bit where income drops off, you get, you get the low walk, of, you get the worst of it all. Not walkable and high concentrations of air pollution. So this is, and then upper left uh, is um, walkability itself. <coughs> so this, the, the, the takeaway here is that as this map shows in B, um, the concentrations of air pollution are very close to roadway edge. So when you get into a situation where we have now housing shortages and you're looking at where to house the, you know, those that are homeless or disadvantaged to find housing, most of the programs are focusing on where land is the cheapest and are concentrating that housing on the busiest arterials in our central areas of our regions. That is actually um, really uh, causes really bad health outcomes for that population or the, those more disadvantaged. Um, so that's just a reality we have to deal with um, and hopefully figure out maybe through cost benefit analysis to demonstrate that societally it's worth paying the difference. Uh, um, uh, and it's certainly in uh, certain countries with social, with almost every country. Uh, a uh, developed country has socialized um, healthcare um, that you pay the cost one way or the other, and it's a, probably a lot bigger of a cost 
on, uh, on, on the backside. So anyways, one step further is these charts. Um, so this is just focusing on NO uh, oxides or nitrous oxide, the um, low, medium, and high versus walkability. So if you're of a lower income, so this is QAI PPE, which is a quintile of annual income per person equivalent in Canada. So wealthy people versus, um, excuse me, poorer people versus wealthier. So if you're poor and you're in a more, uh, what the concentration, so high for high walkability, a much higher percentage of people that are low income, that are in walkable environments, have um, really high concentrations of NO. That is not the case. In fact, the inverse um, relationship exists for wealthy people. Wealthier people, there's a much, the 37 versus 12% of those that are um, uh, um, uh, low income versus high income are living in conditions where they have high, high exposure to uh, uh, particulates uh, if they're in a walkable environment. So. These are um, results from 12 years ago, not a new story. Um, so this is a map, now I'm gonna shift to some national, we, so um, we have data for the whole, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna use data from the United States for a good bit of my talk, a little bit of Canada um, as well, um, working in collaborations globally. Um, these results hold up uh, pretty consistently in other parts of the world. So I'm gonna use, this is Seattle. Um, and just the, the spatial distribution, um, it's actually where I am today or tonight, um, uh, is um, you can see to the south and where the darker colors have higher concentrations of people of color and who are lower income. Now, remember that spatial pattern, we've measured it quantitatively, statistically, the correlation is extremely high. By the way, walkability, and exposure to oxide, uh, nitrous oxide correlated at about 0.6 or 0.7 in Vancouver. That's really high. That's a problem, meaning that we've known for a long time that the more walkable places, even though they show health benefits overall for the, for the general population, are being discounted or the potential benefits of walkability um, what it shows is that I showed you the drop off in, di in, in diabetes um, that happens in more walkable places. We found that for heart disease. I've seen that pattern in so many studies, um, maybe not to that extent, but similar to similar directionality and significance. So we are, and that's not taking into account or separating out or teasing out the effect of increased exposure to air pollution, meaning that even though these other uh, problems exist, we still witness reductions in chronic disease for the general population, but not when you slice it by income and focus on the most disadvantaged. They're not getting that benefit. In fact, quite the opposite. So, so I just thought I'd mention that. And now I'm gonna, um, I'll ask, am I audible just to check in? Just to know that I'm being heard. Yes, we hear you. Okay, cool. <laughs> I've I've had this before with our you know modern you you know you go for a while and then you realize no one no one could hear you. All right, so onward. Some of these cofactors. So we started to develop a composite measure of all the factors associated with walkability, tree canopy noise, injury risk, air pollution, those two different air pollution factors that are quite different, uh, proximity to emissions and um, uh, from uh, specific uh, um, emissions from specific uh, transportation facilities. So we created a composite measure and it tracks, it looks just like the income map and the um, uh, ethnicity map pretty close. Um, so uh, not surprising, but tree canopy, so, tree canopy coverage here in, in Seattle, um, obviously health supportive, has a new meaning now more than we thought historically, although not new knowledge, uh, but with the heat island, uh, um, with, with heat impacts that we've had in urban areas and heat island effect, um, uh, tree canopy is the inverse. It is the cooling factor. It's the thing that we can do. Uh, one of the things that we can do to make places tolerable or, or a lot healthier 
um, not just for, from a health perspective of having shade and, and uh, um, aesthetics um, and other benefits of trees that they provide, but also having uh, a relief from heat. Um, so proximity to loud noise, again, similar spatial pattern um, uh, using a cut point of 70 decibels, um, pet and bike traffic crashes, um, also concentrated in the lower income uh, minority areas um, in terms of rates per, po per population. Um, again, uh, um, here's proximity to freight facilities. So that's just um, sort of an environmental. And what we find is the population living in the U US in the United States is block groups, small geographic areas with the worst environmental exposure risk. Um, for 15% people of color, more than double compared to 5%, 5 point or about eight, 6% white and 12% low income, nearly one and a half times higher compared to only 8.1% high income. And these are generalized results across the entire United States. We have data at the block group level on all these factors for the entire uh, continental, well, the entire United States, continental and Alaska and Hawaii. Um, so a little bit of drilling into this a little more so you can get the point um, from another perspective. Here's the average is the tree canopy coverage in the United States on average is about 21% of the surface has tree canopy. Higher income are above that point, um, uh, 23%. Uh, white is almost 30%, whereas low income are well under. Um, I can go off into the greater detail on the right versus urban, suburban, and rural. rural. What's kind of interesting is, um, and you can see the same pattern holds. Um, for rural, um, there's actually not that much difference uh, by high and low income, uh, and that's probably not too surprising. But within an urbanized area, uh, the differences remain. Employment mix uh, is something that we use as a surrogate for mixed use, because we have data on it everywhere. Um, and you can see again, uh, you know, a, a more mixed uh, employment environment um, is associated with uh, higher income and uh, being white versus lower. And these, these are all, uh, this is a factor that is very significantly correlated with active travel and with better health outcomes. Um, so you can see in the urban area, uh, the pattern is extreme uh, um, uh, and, um, it's, it's really quite um, kind of interesting results. So people living in high, very, and high versus very high risk areas, this is an expire, environmental exposure of people of color. Um, uh, so there's uh, um, quite a difference um, here. Uh, the green are people of color and the yellow bars are white. And you can just see uh, extreme exposure, much worse for people of color versus um, uh, those that are white. And you know, going to the other extreme, a uh, very low exposure is experienced by the white, and uh, uh, and much less by people of color. So, um, or unfort don't have the uh, benefit of being in a, in a less risk environment. So, I, you know, all this data is completely self-reinforcing, and none of it's surprising at all. But it is informative to look at it with the metrics that we've been using to measure the environment as related to health. Um, and also GHG uh, emissions of uh, production as well. Um, so uh, this is similar. This is kind of a over uh, on income, a uh, similar pattern, uh, maybe not quite as extremely different, but similar pattern um, as was before. So now I'm gonna shift to um, the, uh, this is a, uh, an analysis cross-sectionally led um, uh, by Lindsey Braun, uh, colleague working with me um, uh, on our national uh, environment database um, that we built for Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Lindsay's a pro uh, assistant professor, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. So this is a, a work that she led and analytically with our data um, and uh, um, is leading to uh, some interesting results. Um, so uh, um, this is from a presentation that she gave at uh, Association of Collegiate Schools a planning conference a couple of weeks ago um, uh, with our involvement. Uh, so, so background and motivations depends on, so is this same question, which is how does walkability relate with these other cofactors such as air pollution and injury and accessibility? And then how does that affect uh, the, the outcomes, um, uh, uh, travel and health outcomes? 
so I'm just going to show a couple of slides of this. So, um, um, so you can see um, for the different groups, um, uh, the, the ex so for low, I think that the, um, so this is low versus high walkability. Um, so what we see is, and this is, this is a problem from a research. So if we have been demonstrating that walkability is good for your health, but we also show that persons of color um, and um, those that are lower income are actually in more walkable environments than the, than, um, but they get the, but the point is they get the bad form of walkability. So it's causing problems from an investment and a, a messaging perspective to say that we need to be promoting walkability. We need to get those that are more disadvantaged able to stay in or live in environments that are healthier. And we've now correlated walkability with being healthier. Yet in fact, we're able to show or people are more are, are also aware that that those that are more disadvantaged are actually living in more walkable environments. Well, as I've said already, um, they're getting a form of walkability. They're getting the walkability. They're getting the density. They're not getting job mix. They're not getting parks. They're not getting trees. They're not getting um, relief from, from from the sun and from getting shade. They're not getting the seating and the benches and, and all the amenities. They're just getting the, the compactness um, and maybe access to transit, uh, but um, not much else, along with a lot of air pollution exposure. So this, this is kind of interesting. This uh, shows um, you know, the different factors um, and this sociodemographic disadvantage are associated with walkability. And you can see uh, uh, those percent linguistic isolation having the highest uh, um, association live in the most walkable environments. Um, not quite sure what to make of this yet. We're just kind of um, it's exploratory, but it's interesting. So we're we're starting to look at how different groups uh, array um, in terms of those that are disadvantaged relative to walkability, because we can actually do that and through that exploratory exercise form some hypotheses that we can test. Finally, um, the digital divide. So. During COVID, we've learned um, access to the internet determines whether or not you can work from home um, if you have a job that would allow you. So this digital divide is a term that I'm sure many of you have heard of and maybe use. Adverse economic impacts of COVID are largely borne by those without reliable internet access who are low income and located in rural areas. This was developed by the Regional Planning Agency for San Diego, SANDAG. Uh, the MPO, Metropolitan Planning Organization, the recipient for federal transportation dollars in, in that region. 23% of households earning less than 50,000 per year do not have broadband internet. That's a lot. 42% of people who live in unincorporated outlying parts of San Diego County have fixed broadband compared with 97% uh, in urban areas. So if you're living in an outlying area um, and you're lower income, probably pretty difficult situation over the last year and a half or two years approaching, hard to believe. Between 20 and 40% of students in many local districts are underconnected or lack internet access. So there's even an age uh, divide happening, really important. So with that, um, I'm gonna check on time. Um, I think I probably have maybe about another five or 10 minutes. Is that correct? Is that okay? Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, okay. take your time. Thank you. All right, so now I'm going to shift into some, just showing some of the research that we've been doing um, and uh, um, it has not been uh, parsed out and specifically targeted or addressed in the way that it needs to. Um, the distinctive difference of how the results might address um, disparities, but I'll show the research um, anyways. So here is a study that we've been publishing a good bit on. It's, um, I picked it because it's an intervention. Here's a city of Vancouver, very progressive, um, delightful from an urban planning uh, perspective, a transportation, uh, um, active transportation is that they've been developing greenways throughout the city to make it safe to bike and get around. They've been reappropriating road space away from cars 
uh, to uh, active modes. Um, and they wanted some evidence early on when they started doing it um, to show that it, to demonstrate it was um, uh, having a health benefit and uh, really affecting behavior in a positive way. So they took um, uh, uh, this corridor, uh, Comox Street um, between Stanley Park, well, in the downtown, um, and we then um, did a study on it. They hired, hired us, hired me and my students. And we went out and collected data on 500, we ended up 524 households before and after the Greenway was built. Uh, and we got uh, a nice sample of people along the Greenway and then further away from the Greenway, which are, are our controls. Um, and we've been publishing a good bit. So this is what it looked like beforehand. It's pretty beautiful. I was kind of like, you know, I don't know that I can tell you that we can improve upon this in terms of people should feel pretty comfortable walking along this lovely tree lined street. Um, but when you take the right of way and you convert it from uh, cars mostly to bike and pedestrian along the corridor, mostly a bikeway, um, but has a lot of pedestrian amenities, um, you really do shift the relative utility. You've made it harder to drive. So if you're gonna walk, from the West End, you're gonna walk through downtown and you got a choice of all these parallel streets, you'd pick this one because it's safe. Um, and uh, it probably over time has more um, interest. Uh, and, and now what we're seeing is land use changes are coming. Uh, the zoning allows um, to make it, you know, there's, we're starting to see bike oriented retail um, and that sort of thing is, is occurring more and more on, along these corridors. So uh, we published three papers, um, some formatting, things seem to have happened here, but first paper came out led by um, uh, Victor No, my student, and Andy Hong, uh, my good colleague who what, did his postdoc at UBC and is, is um, now at University of Utah, um, found, and Andy's credited uh, with this 300 meter distance decay, uh, did a really kind of a, a really nice analysis showing where is the impact of the Greenway um, felt and how far until it's gone. And uh, so we learned uh, three blocks, um, 300 meters uh, is what we found, and it seemed to work really well. Um, those within 300 meters of the Greenway reduced their transport GHG emissions by 21% versus those further away. Having a control group before and after is essential. Otherwise, exogenous factors cannot be controlled, and the results you see could be a function of something else, which actually happened car sharing was piloted and implemented in Vancouver as one of the three major global uh, sites in downtown. That made driving easier. So for those living further away from the Greenway, we actually saw their driving go up. Um, those within 300 meters of the Greenway, Greenway were twice as likely to meet recommended physical activity levels versus, the, um, and those further away were less likely. I have no idea what happened, here, um, but, uh, and then um, uh, the third paper just published um, um, those, uh, um, uh, this is the cycling paper, and I think in transport policy, I can't see the bottom of the slide. Um, uh, those within 300 meters are our cases, um, our um, experimental group uh, showed a five-fold uh, increase in the number of reported cycling trips. So now we're publishing other papers um, on that same uh, study. Uh, those are three. Um, but uh, this is, uh, um, you know, really helpful. Uh, the city used the results to justify investing in a regional or a citywide greenway program uh, that's been massive. Uh, lots of greenways have been built. I went and presented the results to city council when we first got our first set of results and they passed a motion that day to support the funding of several greenways in the, in the, in the city. And, uh, you know, they actually had the vision and foresight to want to, uh, you know, working together collaboratively, have the evidence to, to make the case to the public. So um, in San Diego, um, we've been doing a lot of work as well, um, long ago. Um, this is from 2012. This was a Healthy Communities Atlas um, and just showing a composite set of metrics. This Healthy Communities Atlas is available online where we took several metrics and layered them walkability, transportation infrastructure. And actually what would have gone well with my talk is we have, we have some really cool maps that, that, that layer income and poverty 
with walkability and with transportation infrastructure. So we worked really hard to, to see how those spatial relationships pan out. Um, this is uh, the application of a software tool that we build from a lot of the large surveillance data sets where we have 20, 30, 40, or 50,000 participants, where we have the power to detect relationships with chronic disease outcomes. This just got published this week after 10 years or maybe eight years, probably eight years, shouldn't overdate it, but it took a while um, uh, where we did all the statistical analysis that explains uh, kind of the, you know, and the methods are in this paper uh, published in, I think, transport policy as well. So this is Palomar Gateway. It's a, strain, it's a community uh, lowering moderate income uh, and moderate to low income in some places. They have a, a, a rail station uh, near the Mexican border uh, along the San Diego trolley alignment. Uh, here's the station and they have a vision and a plan to rebuild um, when the market uh, um, conditions uh, kick in. Uh, we've had a really strong real estate market, uh, but in this corridor, uh, not as much activity is happening yet, uh, although some, some has happened, uh, not quite as much as, as I think is hoped. But anyways, they have a plan to have 3,000 more people move into this area and to replace single family with multifamily housing, make it more mixed use, a lot more retail, a lot more park space, and all of these features. So this is a scenario planning exercise where we compared, compared to the base scenario, the change scenario, which is all of this development coming in, becoming denser, but also having all these amenities would result in these health impacts, which are um, here. Um, so I will just read these numbers because I know them. Uh, this is what you can see, a significant, a 15.39% uh, reduction of adults with high blood pressure and about a 10% reduction uh, of adults with type 2 diabetes. This is by developing a statistical model and populating the coefficients in the model or the variables in the model uh, with values, the Xs with values, X1, 2, 3, and 4, of the scenario as calculated through a scenario planning software tool. <clears throat> For the metrics, we have the demographics, um, and then we plug in the actual metrics in our regression model, and we solve for Y, which is a health outcome. And you can see there's a whole bunch of them. The results all in the expected direction, summarized here, 68% increase in minutes of daily walking for transport. And I mentioned the blood pressure and the diabetes reduction that, that we saw. Um, very useful results, uh, very practical. This has been since factored up to the state of California and nationally for different iterations of the scenario planning tool that's called the California Public Health Assessment Model and the National Public Health Assessment Model with results here for LA where we modeled their long range transportation plan and showed results in the expected direction where significant increases in active transportation, reduction in driving, and then reductions in most of the chronic diseases in the expected direction. In conclusion, we are obviously still immersed in an era that is like none we've ever expected. Um, after COVID, normal could be, as written here, profoundly different. Um, lots of different strategies, lots of willingness to do pretty interesting things within our cities, um, a willingness to reappropriate road space in cities that are much less progressive than and in neighborhoods that would never consider it um, before. So that is happening, um, that's exciting. Uh, but there's still a lot of resistance to density um, and perhaps uh, without addressing the air pollution exposure issue, maybe with some reasonableness um, and some caution, but that resistance to density makes transit not work um, and it prevents us from really uh, developing, uh, redu uh, redu reducing GHG emissions, which is our, really most critical threat um, as a species. So um, uh, obviously lots of different answers uh, and debates about this. Um, it could also result in sprawl. As we know, a decoupling of the work from the home is having huge outward growth. Um, so suburban sprawl, is it a super spreader? Uh, um, is COVID a super spreader? Uh, looks like it is. Um, and that's a real problem. And how we deal with that is uh, something we're gonna have to grapple with pretty quickly. So other investments are being considered uh, re that um, in even places, San Diego and others around the world, lots of really interesting 
um, things uh, happening and hopefully um, I look forward to hearing some ideas that you all have and appreciate your kindness and attention uh, as I um, went through my talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Larry. Okay, so now I think uh, the audience has already uh, some questions in the chat box and also uh, Zhuang Yuan has raised her hand. So maybe I invite her to ask her questions by turning on her cam and unmuting herself. Zhuang Yuan. Oh, hi. Um, can you guys hear me? Oh, yes. Hi, Professor. Um, thank you for the talk. I do have a question, a couple of questions, actually. One is really uh, related to the uh, the health outcome software you're talking about. I think that's a very interesting implementation, too. But I'm curious about how you actually interpret the results. Um, for example, you mentioned like by increasing or change certain uh, grain factor, you are able to reduce the diabetes by a certain amount. And then when you talk to the public or when you draft the report, are you talking about that by doing this kind of intervention, we're able to attract people that who are more healthy in this, in, because it's not planned yet, I, I believe. So it's going to be sold, uh, sold to anyone who want to purchase a real estate there. So if you're doing this kind of planning, are you able to attract people who are, have like more healthy habits? Or you're saying that you attract people here and then they live here, they will be able to improve their health because they live in this kind of environment. Like okay. how, how do you interpret this yeah. kind of yeah. Yeah. The causality yeah. issues. Yeah, thank you. Very, very good. So so obviously attitudinal, we, we know uh, it's been heavily debated, attitudinal predisposition uh, determines behavior um, as well as the physical environment that we live in. So if you, you're given different choice sets, um, you're going to make different decisions because you have different trade-offs. If, if walking is not an option, that's not going to be something you're going to be in your choice set. If there's no um, safe way to bike, not in your choice set. Um, if uh, driving is prohibitively expensive um, or um, the congestion is so high, you can't, you know, it's just the travel time would be prohibitive, um, not in your choice set. Um, so different environments give us different choice sets and different relationships between those choices. So it's not an, the, the, the question that you asked, you had the word or, it's and, it's just not right. or at all. So, so, the, so, so the, the reality is some people will be attracted to that environment because they are predisposed to wanting to walk, no doubt about mm -hmm. it. I mean, don't you, don't you eat in the restaurants that have the food you like? I mean, you know, it's, it's a, why wouldn't you? But, but the fact yeah. is that, let me, I'll finish my answer. Thank mm -hmm. you. So, so the, um, the, the way that we've learned and, and have sort of, it's comparable to if you live next door to your sister and for some reason, and let's say your sister likes to walk more than you, she will. Um, but let's say you both move closer to your parents for some reason and, um, they live in a less walkable environment. You will both walk less, but she will still walk more. Both the environment mm -hmm. and your preferences matter. And so mm -hmm. this argument that it isn't the environment that's affecting behavior, it's people's preferences, is really actually fairly silly. And I'll tell <laughs> you why. Because what would be better than to have an unmet demand for something that's healthy, that people want to do? So what? Let them move into the environment, provide those environments so their, their underlying attitudinal predisposition to be healthier and generate less air pollution and greenhouse gas emissions can be manifest. What's wrong with that? I never understood that argument at all, and I never will. Okay, thanks a lot. So I think uh, we can move you know, to the next question in the chat box. Sito, uh, maybe you can ask the question. Thank you. Okay, uh, I received a question from uh, Fei Yan Zhang. Uh, uh, based on your finding, what do you think that the planners can do for those who are currently experiencing the bad form of walkability? I guess uh, they are experiencing some air pollution, et cetera, the disadvantage due to walkability. What what the, what, what can the planner can do? Hmm. A lot, a lot of, well, obviously uh, we can, prioritize appeal, you know, do the research that shows the need. I mean, there's a lot of research already, but um, highlight the importance of strategies to reduce exposure to air pollution in highly dense urbanized areas. Um, transportation strategies that require like, in, I know some cities 
Uh, Hong Kong, I'm sure, has some of this, but I know that Singapore, um, electric vehicles only in the urban center, uh, or having car-free zones, um, or having, I mean, my goodness, there's, there's a whole tons, there, there's so many things that we can do, um, but we have to, you know, provide, you know, I think, you know, it's the, the evidence, I mean, we, there's a, there's that division between how far, you know, we can't worry as researchers with the, you know, we'll hear like evidence only goes so far. Hmm. Lack of evidence doesn't do you, a, I mean, you know, also is problematic. Um, so as researchers, we have to at least appeal to those that believe that evidence matters. Um, and, and maybe part of our role as educators is to ensure that we hold with our beliefs that evident that <laughs> that we should be making decisions mm -hmm. based on evidence rather than counter to evidence or even in the peer you know in the United States you know there's like we have alternative facts I mean you know that's a very painful thing to hear for a society to have that come out of the White House you know so so you know hopefully our job is you know we don't want to be advocates because then we lose credibility so we have to partner with ngos with government and other folks that can actually push but we just in the back provide the evidence and make a very strong case and uh and and identify those what we can do is actually show the strategies that are the most cost effective um that are the most uh actionable um and that are the most effective and, and that's our responsibility is to figure out what that is Mm. Thank Excellent. you. Yeah. So I think uh, we have time only for one more question, and I'll take it from the chat box. So um, does poor people, I mean, it should be do, right? Do poor people suffer more negative uh, effects from walkability than rich people only because cities uh, have poor people living together? So how about if we make cities that the poor and the rich can live closer together, can we solve this problem? Kind of more inclusive, you know, kind of uh, neighborhood environment. And what, what's your view on this, Larry? Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. Um, housing mix, having a variety of housing types in small areas can do a whole lot of good. And maybe this is what this uh, um, question is about. Mm. Um, is that as we age and go through different, it's not just income levels, as we go through different points in life, we have different needs of ho housing needs. You're having a family, you need a bigger house first, you know, you're maybe living alone, going to school, get a partner or whatever, and you have a slightly larger home, and then you have a family. And what happens typically, at least I've seen in, in, in some most car dependent culture, cities that are the most car dependent, is the families then depart and go out to the suburbs or whatever where the homes are cheaper to have a bigger home and then move you know and you lose the fabric that social connectedness so if if, if neighborhoods had a greater heterogeneity of housing mm -hmm. type especially on the back side so maybe you know we're able to retain the senior citizens the mat the matriarch and patriarchs of our communities so that when they get older, they don't have to leave that there's multifamily housing mixed in. And then you have the, you do get income mix and you do get that ability to um, live in a place throughout your life where you're part of a community and you have that social fabric that can be maintained. Maybe mm -hmm. that's, we should really work hard to make that happen. Yeah, thank you. I think, you know, it would be particularly interesting to see, you know, kind of what would be the evidence from like Hong Kong super dense, you know, compass cities, and how would that, you know, compare from to evidences that we have collected in the North American context. So I think uh, all of the audience has benefited a lot from your sharing as well as the QA today. So thanks a lot. <laughs>